She was the architect of an education revolution. She set the boundaries for a whole new approach to teaching children with disabilities. But now Baroness Warnock says the revolution has failed. So is she right? <laughs> Welcome to the big debate. Children with special needs have always posed a core dilemma. On the one hand, can we afford to include them in mainstream education, no matter what the cost or upheaval involved? On the other, can we afford not to include them for fear of condemning millions to a life as second-class citizens? For three decades, education has resolutely pursued the inclusion option. But now, doubts are emerging. And the reasons why lie in the way that inclusion has evolved. Until the 1970s, children with special needs were taught separately, some in remedial classes, some in special schools. But by the end of the decade, the government had turned its back on segregation and come up with a new philosophy. The architect of this revolution was former head teacher Mary Warnock, chair of a wide-ranging committee of inquiry. Warnock's 1978 report, later backed by an Education Act, did three crucial things. It denounced the segregation of children on clinical or medical grounds. It coined the term special educational needs. And it introduced the statement, a legally binding assessment that guaranteed resources for children with severe need. Since Warnock's reform, successive governments have increasingly pursued a policy of educating special needs children in mainstream classes as a matter of right. Inclusion is now backed by a whole raft of laws. Today, there are one and a half million children with SEN. All but 90,000 of them are based in mainstream schools. And special schools are closing down. Inclusion is, of course, a noble aim, but critics now question its implementation. Some teachers claim that SEN children cause classroom disruption. Schools fear an overwhelming burden on resources. And parents fear an erosion of the right to choose special school places for their children. Last year, Mary Warnock herself broke silence, calling for special schools not only to be kept open, but to be turned into centres of excellence. And she predicted that inclusion, as currently practised, will leave, I quote, a disastrous legacy. Baroness Warnock, disastrous legacy, that's a strong statement. Why so? I think there is a very large number of children with special needs who really don't flourish in the mainstream and those children are being deprived of a right which is a right to education and I think that one of the difficulties has been that special needs, SEN, has come to be regarded as something that's a kind of uniform um, class of children, all of whom can equally well be included in the mainstream. When we made our original report in 1978, part of our aim was to widen the scope of the concept of special education and to get people to see that there were lots of children already in mainstream schools who did have special educational needs and that special education um, was not a sort of, didn't, wasn't just for children who were a kind of class apart. So, so what you're saying is not that the principle is unsound, but the way it's been implemented is leading down what you describe as the disastrous route. That's exactly it. And, and I think the reason for that is that not enough distinction has been made um, between the different difficulties that children have to, in their education. Andy Raquel from, from SCOPE, um, Disability Charity, that, that's quite an indictment to suggest that inclusion, which you uh, believe in strongly is effectively gone off the rails and isn't delivering for precisely those children you most would wish to uh, benefit? I think the issue is that actually, you, in, in your report, you imply that for three decades we've been resolutely pursuing inclusion. I would question that. I think we've been resolutely pursuing integration. We've been trying to force some of these children into the mainstream without changing the way in which mainstream education is provided. 
it, it's, it's not just about forcing them in and, and, and hoping they will cope, again, words that are used. It's about changing the system, so the way in which you deliver education, the way in which the, the mainstream classroom operates, in order that those children can actually, can actually benefit. Is Mary Warnock, in that sense, uh, with no disrespect, missing the point from your perspective? Yes, I, I think that's right. She's, she's identified that there is an issue. And I think the issue is that education has not become sufficient, ch sufficiently child-centred so that actually the, the needs of each child in, in a situation is met. If you can do that in any situation, why not do it in a mainstream situation so that all children are included? Ian Morris, you come from Newnham where you, you are a development officer for, mm -hmm. uh, in education and, and, and you boast, your, your borough boasts that you have more SEN inclusion than anywhere mm. else in the country. Uh, but you will therefore be aware that it's not only voices like Baroness Warnock, but she's supported by the Audit Commission and Ofsted who are pretty sharply critical of the way in which uh, SEN uh, has developed. I, <clears throat> I'm, not in sure, well, I'm not entirely sure that the criticisms can be fairly directed at what we do in Newham. Um, we don't have any schools that have been failed by Ofsted in, in its recent visits. Um, our schools are, to bandy a few stats if I can, um, uh, second nationally for value added between key stage two, key stage two and key stage four, um, fourth highest from key stage one to key stage two. So our schools are successful. And, and is it working? Are you saying that the inclusion, as uh, contra uh, Baroness Warnock, that as things are now, the system is, from your perspective, done as you do it, working as it should? I think it could be improved. I think I think what the focus of everybody in education, and, and I presume particularly Mr Woodhead might agree here, should be about creating better schools. And good schools, in my view, are inclusive. And um, you can have a very good special school as well, but I would like to think that if you can do it in a special environment, you can probably do it in a mainstream environment. But some children, uh, uh, I think uh, you either quoted to the Baroness or, or the Baroness suggested, that there were a large number of children who were failing to thrive. I would challenge the idea that there were a large number, but there will be young children who are failing to thrive in Newham's inclusive schools, and there will be young children who are failing to thrive in special schools as well. But I would say that given the results and given the outcomes, and for the other members of the school community who live and work alongside these young people, the predominant outcome is positive. Uh, um, Neil Clark, you are a, a head teacher, and you're very uncomfortable with the present situation. There is someone saying the results, Ian saying the results are very positive. Principally because I meet weekly parents for whom this experience on behalf of their children has been quite a damaging one. They come to me with, with stories where resources are inadequate, where facilities are undersubscribed, where there is bullying, where there is teasing of their children, where they don't find the support services they're looking for, which are identified at part three on the statement, they're simply not being delivered in the school setting and they're saying we're looking for something which is going to provide that which is on the statement under one roof. If I could have a pound for every time a parent has said to me we would like the idea of a school which has all the resources and all the facilities that my child needs under one roof rather than chasing this professional from that organisation, from that agency, we have to deal with social services, we have to deal with the LEA, we have to deal with the wheelchair services, we have to deal with the primary care trust and we're driving ourselves distracted in trying to bring these facilities and agencies together. Uh, Philippa Stobbs, you are an ardent advocate from the Council for Disabled Children of inclusion. What is your response to that series of points in broad terms? I, I think the practicalities of uh, very much as Neil suggests that uh, it, that a lot of parents do have a lot of difficulty in securing the right support their child needs in a mainstream school. But I don't think that means that it's a blanket that it doesn't work. Uh, and I think the evidence from the Ofsted reports is that it, it is very, very patchy. In some schools and in some authorities, it's working well. Uh, and I'd like to really pick up Ian's point about actually what we're after is good schools producing good outcomes uh, for the full range of, of children. But this is, a, this, is a, this is a mile away from the disastrous outcome that Lady Warnock is predicting. Yes, I don't think it is disastrous. I, uh, and I, I think the, the other bit that I would challenge is that we have been relentlessly pursuing an inclusion agenda. The phrase I, I used. The, 
Yeah. Yes, I, th I think that the, the evidence suggests that actually inclusion has not progressed that much. So what you're saying is, are you, that, that, that inclusion should go much further and could be much more effective and then you wouldn't have the problem that, um, to an extent, you think that Baroness Warnock has identified? Well, I, I th think that we have to get the provision right because children aren't going to learn and progress unless we're getting the right provision in place for Qu them. Quick come back on that, Mary Warnock. I think we're still in danger of treating all children with special needs as if they were in some way um, joined together by a quality or characteristic that they all share. But that is not at all true because I think the children that I had in mind when I talked about the disastrous legacy were largely children with emotional and behavioural problems or children who were somewhere along the autistic spectrum, particularly children with Asperger's, who are, many of them, very intelligent, but who lack all kinds of instinctive, intuitive, social abilities, which make other children be able to put up with the rough and tumble of school. Okay, they can't. Let, let, let's sort of break this down a little bit. Uh, uh, Chris Woodhead, as everyone, almost everyone knows, um, former Ofsted, Chief, um, is it possible for schools, as it were, to manage effectively the challenge of SEN and deliver for the other children at the school? Some schools do it better than others, but I think it's a hell of a challenge, and I think there is a very real risk that the children who, the mainstream children, are going to be affected by the efforts that the school is putting in. In to, what sense? Well, that the teacher has only finite time and energy. Um, the school has finite resources. And the more children with special educational needs that the school tries to educate, the more difficult it is to cater for the mainstream children in that school. I mean, I, to reflect on a quote from your introduction, I don't accept that inclusion is a noble aim. The only noble aim in education is catering for the particular needs of the particular child, Mary Warnock's point, that uh, children with special educational needs do differ, and trying to meet the aspirations of their parents to impose an ideological, doctrinaire belief on everything that we do is quite simply wrong, whatever the utopian distinction between integrationist and inclusion. I mean, we can argue to the cows come home that if we poured more money in, all would be well. We've got to work with realities, and reality in the secondary school is immensely difficult. Your, 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 your bottom line position, as it were, is that inclusion is, a, is an ideological uh, insult to the urge to educate all children to the best of their abilities. My bottom line is that inclusion, the belief that inclusion is the only way forward, is simply wrong. Yes, we should be trying to cater for the particular needs of particular children, and in a democracy that we still just about live in, we should be trying to do what parents want, not to impose our own expert knows best beliefs upon them. Yeah, Ian Morris. I strangely concur with elements of that, if I might. Um, and one is that we should do what parents want, because the history of development of inclusion in Newham was parent-led. It wasn't government-led. It happened in response to uh, the, the noble lady's paper uh, initially. But parents of children with special educational needs who wanted their children to go to the same school as their friends when they went from primary to secondary got elected onto the council. One of them then chaired the education committee and started to make decisions around moving school allocation and resources so their children could stay with their friends what to be educated. What about those don't want? Um, well, as I say, we do, we do have residual special provisions as well. Um, we have one remaining it, but special does that, school. Does that mean, we're going to come on to this in more detail later. Of course. But does it mean that those, that, 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 that those who don't want, all of those who don't want, get what they do want? Or do I some of them have to, to lump it? I think, um, as I say, I, I, I think that if, if, one is, if one is committed to the idea that education is a social purpose, uh, has a social purpose and an educative purpose within that, and it's a social experience, that there is a moral high ground to maintaining the practice that you educate people with their peers, the people they have to live well, that's with, that's a very we've, 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 we've alighted on a very interesting, very yeah. sharp division there about oh. what the, 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 whether it's moral high ground or educational oh. principles about what you do. But I want to bring in, in practical terms, um, Minia Rees, you are a teacher. In fact, you're an award-winning special educational needs teacher. Schools, we're always told by teachers, are filled with bureaucracy, administration. You now have to watch most of the time, teachers' TV as well. Um, um, do you manage OK? Can you cope doing what you do in the school in which you are? I think it depends a lot on the ethos of the school you're working in. And if the ethos of the school is has an inclusive approach, 
with the sort of governors and the head working towards including purpose with all different needs, it can work, but only with um, the right funding and the resources mm. as well. And I believe strongly that you have to look at every child as an individual. And you have to be quite honest when you discuss whether that child is transferring from primary education to your secondary school, whether you can meet the needs of that individual child. It, it's interesting. We, 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 we asked um, the Teachers TV associates, which are people who, who regularly watch um, Teachers TV, what they thought. And uh, generally, perhaps not entirely surprisingly, they came back to resources, resources, mm -hmm. resources, plus training. I mean, you, you've got this inclusion is right in principle, but only if it's properly resourced, one email, another. I have to agree that the principle of inclusion is good. This is contra um, uh, um, the view we just heard now. However, in my experience, it's a cost-cutting exercise that puts mainstream school under pressure. And then one more, a couple more on training. Even the best teachers with the best intentions don't really have a clue unless they've been given some training. And then another teacher, as a teacher, I find it very difficult dealing with children in the bottom sets with differing and often conflicting special needs. Darren Northcott, you represent a huge number of teachers. What's your take? I think we've just heard um, from our colleague there that there are occasions where pupils with special educational needs can be educated extremely successfully in mainstream schools. And I don't think anyone is saying that they can't. I think the problems we've got, and to go back to Chris Woodhead's term, an ideological commitment in some local authorities that regardless of the individual needs of that child, they will be educated in a mainstream setting. And our members tell us on a regular basis, our members working in mainstream schools, that that leads to a wide range of problems in terms of meeting the needs of those children themselves, in terms of the impact that that has upon the wider life of the school, and also in terms of the professional frustration that teachers feel going in day in, day out, trying to do the best job that they can, but having to teach children who are simply not in an appropriate um, setting to meet their educational so, so needs. Philippa Stobbs, you're in the vanguard of a kind of ideological uh, struggle for the soul of the education system. I overstate it to make the point. <laughs> uh, you, you do indeed overstate it. Um, I think I've made it very clear that um, what we must be looking for is the best possible outcomes for all children. Um, now, I don't think we can countenance in this country the situation where we either would force all children into mainstream school or decide on an arbitrary quota of children who ought to be herded into a separate special school. Uh, I think, you know, the, the whole country, the whole education system is predicated on some degree of choice and some expectation that parents can have their choice mm. met. And I think it's important to recognise that parents have only just achieved an increased right to express a preference for a mainstream school and have a reasonable expectation that choice would be met. You, you were nodding, nodding away at that <laughs> in agreement with the, the thought that parents do have rights. Because how do you, if a parent says, as we're told, we just heard parents says, well, actually, the way we want to exercise our right is through special needs schools. We think we get better equipment, better resources, and the resources aren't there, whatever you may say, and they're not going to be there in the secondary school. How do you deliver both that right to the, to, 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 to the parents, Andy, and at the same time deliver um, the inclusion in which you passionately believe? I, I, think, I think the issue is, in a sense, that the, 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 the issue is that the parental choice isn't actually there. For some parents, in certain situations, the reality is there isn't the choice one way or the other. Do you believe that parents in the end should have absolute choice once they, their child is identified as having special educational needs? It's up then to the parent to choose. Yes, but that's on the basis that it's a real choice. Okay. And it can only be a real choice if, there's a pro is, if there is the proper resources. So, so at, the, at the end of the day, it's an even playing field between a mainstream school and special provision. And reality, that's not the case. Chris Woodhead, resources, resources, resources. Well. You know, it, it is utopian, I, I think. Um, the argument is that if only we spent more and more money on education, if only we poured more resources into schools, integration would become inclusion. Um, maybe, I don't know, but the truth is we're not going to spend more and more money on education and there are other competing demands upon the finite pot. So I think we have to look at where we are. OK, what we'll actually do there is to take a, a brief pause and indeed look at where we are in one sense. We're going to look at how one school is rising to the challenge of providing inclusive education. Glossopdale Community School in Derbyshire has enthusiastically pursued inclusion for over 20 years. As this clip from the Teachers TV series School Matters reveals, 
Glossopdale is a large secondary school that nonetheless devotes substantial resources to SEN provision. Glossopdale has nearly 2,000 students spread over three sites. It's fully comprehensive with the full range of abilities from students striving to reach basic literacy standards to those gaining entrance to top universities. There are 40 staff on the special needs team. Of those, 12 are teachers and the other 28 are teaching assistants. Um, some of the, of the teaching staff are linked to year groups and they work, have an overview of the statement of students and all the students with special needs in that year group and they'll go up through the school with them so they get to know them very well. Other members of the team are linked to curriculum areas so they'll work with those areas looking at curriculum differentiation, delivering again in class support. And then we have some teachers who are behaviour specialists who work with those with challenging behaviours. And the teaching assistants are split between those three teams. And with this level of commitment and resource, it appears they can succeed with children with a broad range of special needs. Well, there's the proposition at that school suggesting it can be done and, and they would like to claim that it is being done. Um, Neil Clark, and yet you think your parents are saying, no, it can't be done. Those that I meet are saying that, and I was interested in that the past partners of the Philippi use herded into special schools. The children for whom I have responsibility don't feel they've been herded into some segregated outpost of society in which they're excluded. They generally do feel included in what they are doing. Their right to be educated with their peers, for them, is to be with appropriate peers, other disabled children, other children with special needs, and they enjoy competing against one another, and, and, and they do, you know, spin off against each other very frequently. Uh, uh, Philippa Stops, isn't there a, a, a real problem here that, as it happens, people talk about inclusion in the school, we've talked about inclusion integration, uh, but actually they have to be, uh, if it's going to be done effectively inside the single school, they have to be separated off. So inclusion becomes, does it not, a sort of slightly meaningless concept. If it's going to be effective for the special educational needs child, they're actually being separated. Well, I think, I think there's a, quite a distinction between Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. Key Stage 4, you have much wider range of flexibilities, and I think Key Stage 3 is therefore the more challenging uh, period. I think that uh, it's quite possible to include children in a range of different activities. Now, it doesn't mean that every child spends their time in the classroom with every other child for every activity. But I think that you can include children genuinely into the, to the life of the school without necessarily putting them into the same classroom for, for every aspect of that. Which, Chris Woodhead, one might argue, is very good for those children who aren't the SEN children because they learn to be socially integrated with children, other children who are, uh, when they first see them, have potentially very surprising, maybe alarming challenges and problems that they learn to see are actually part of what it is to be a human being. Sure, I'd agree with that, and I'd say that that is one of the benefits of inclusion. But I do think you have to ask two questions of that clip that we've just seen. The first is, what could Glossopdale do if it had used the money that, had been, that it was using for the included children, for mainstream children? You know, the resources are finite, as I've been saying. A lot of money is going on those children. What could it do otherwise with that money? And come up with a proposition. Well, I mean, it could do, you know, anything that it wanted to do. Um, there we could buy more computers, it could buy more books, it could range more extracurricular activities. It could do any number of things. And secondly, I mean, the clip doesn't answer the second question, which is, would those children that we saw being educated at that school be educated better? at a special school. Um, there's absolutely no evidence there that they are better off in the mainstream school. Well, let me pick up on both those things, but on the first question with you, Ian, Ian Morris, what could be done with the resources <laughs> that wasn't being done in order to deliver as effective SEN as possible? It's, it... I mean, you, you've got a huge education budget in, mm. in, in Unum. Mm -hmm. Are you sp unable to spend money on things you, that most of your parents and children would like to have the money spent on because you're having to put it into the SEN pot? I wouldn't say so. Um, I mean, th there's no evidence that I've seen that there are areas, particular say, areas of the curriculum or initiatives that we're not being able to follow at the same pace as other local authorities nationally. You know, the gifted and talented support is there, the support for ethnic minority learners is there, uh, curriculum development takes place. You know, there is a generally high level of satisfaction um, when 
Ofsted have arrived and inspected our schools, parents have been spoken to and they haven't said, you know, well, we want more of this, we want less of that. I think there's the, the, one of the issues is we are in a rather evidence-free debate in a lot of ways because it's very difficult to create a controlled experiment and educate the same well, child is, in both environments. This is one of the major criticisms of the, of the Audit Commission. No one actually knows what's happening. Exactly. You're all spending money, all <laughs> having views, and no one actually knows what the effect of what you're doing is. L let me pick that up with, with, with Menir, Chris Woodhead's second point there, Menir. It's quite likely, he suggests, that actually with the focus at a special school, those children, the kind of children that you, you are teaching, would do better than even with the best will in the world you're able to deliver for them in a, in a mainstream school. It's possible, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully He's not. Off. <laughs> if that... I'm just rephrasing as I <laughs> put it, Jonathan. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully we are able to remove those barriers they have and to ensure access for them for the curriculum. If we feel we are unable to do that, then we want to be perfectly honest with everyone concerned mm -hmm. and possibly to move that child if the parents and if the child and if everyone working with that child, the specialist teachers and everyone involved, believe that child would be better off in a special school, then that should definitely be considered. You have to assess all the time the progress the child is making as well. Dar Darren Northcott, um, the Newham experience would suggest, if that's a, a description that is accurate, that your sort of dismay at the present situation is overstated. Well, it may be my dismay, but it's also the dismay felt by many of our members. I think one of the... the not, not but, do you well, think I mean, she's an exception, many in this no, sense? No, but, but I think what we're saying is, is that some pupils can be educated very effectively in the mainstream school, but others, there are circumstances where it is appropriate to look at special alternate provision. And I think one of the key features that our members report to us on, on a fairly frequent basis is that the patterns of provision around uh, the country are extremely variable. The way in which different local authorities interpret that term, inclusion, is very different. Here we've got our colleague here from Newham, and he's got a very, you know, clear vision, and their authority has a clear vision of what they mean by inclusion. You can go to a different authority, and there's a very different approach. So, 30 so there's a terminological issue this here. Is, that we need to 30 think years on from Good Baroness Warnock's original work in 1978, and we still don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Mary. Well, I think one feature that probably is quantifiable and is known and hasn't yet been mentioned is the number of children, particularly with behavioural difficulties and the Asperger's children I've talked about before, um, mm. the number of those who are excluded, actually, from mm. school. I mean, I don't mean <laughs> mentally excluded while they're in the school, but actually shoved out, what we used to call expelled. Mm. And those children really have no chance at all unless they can find a place in a special school. And I think we ought to face the fact that children are expelled from mainstream schools because they cannot fit in. Philippa Stobbs, is it your view that you actually don't need, that, that we, we should be moving towards a situation where we don't actually need any uh, such schools? Well, I, I'd be the first schools. to recognise that not uh, every parent finds the education for their child that they are seeking in a mainstream school. And, and I recognise very well the th things that you're describing, that uh, parents find it very difficult to secure the right services in, in a mainstream school for their child. And in fact, um, some mainstream schools simply do not welcome uh, and, and actually say quite hurtful things to parents about um, not wanting a child like theirs to come to this particular school. And so I would be the first to say that where the provision is not right, we cannot close off that option for parents at the minute. But I, I, I do not know where that takes us. Into the future, uh, I could see we may be able to make inclusion work better and therefore more parents will vote for it. What you have done, in fact, is take us on to our next uh, stage, because given the general drive on mainstream academic standards and also the level of resources that inclusion requires, children with special needs can, so it is said, be caught in a kind of trap with mainstream schools unwilling to adapt their teaching to accommodate individual special needs and LEAs unwilling to grant statements to allow admission to special schools. And that leaves some parents, at least, with little choice from their own perspective but to opt out of the system altogether. Right, full stops. 13-year-old Lewis settles down to do his schoolwork. However, he won't be going anywhere near a classroom. Lewis, who lives in South Gloucestershire, has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. His mother, Haley has taken him out of the Grange, his mainstream school near Bristol, because she's unhappy with his progress. Last year, his reading age was seven years and five months. 
a year on, it's seven year and six months. So at this rate, he'll still be leaving school mm. at the reading age of seven years and nine months. That's right. Which well, to me is, no is not good that's enough. No good for nobody. It's, it's, you know, he's not going to get very far. Lewis's family are also unhappy about the limitations they see in the national curriculum. He don't need to be learning French or Italian when he don't know his, his actual English itself. That's, if they could give him more lessons on more probably maths or English instead of everything else, then I think he would have a more of a chance of, of learning a bit better. The government's SEN strategy signals a shift towards phasing out statementing in favour of directly funding schools to support children with special needs. In the interim, however, some parents remain dissatisfied. They have to have so many points to have a, a statement funded, and I'm under the impression that he falls about 12 points below. And so, as far as we're concerned, the statement really isn't worth a piece of paper it's written on. If he's not funded, why, why bother have a statement at all? And so we're in a sort of a catch-22 because he doesn't seem to fall into any category at the moment. He's just going to go nowhere when he leaves school because he's... Oh, he's just so... He's so far behind, isn't he? That's just an understatement. He's just... Well, he is. He's so far behind. You know, I've got a seven-year-old daughter and he struggles reading her books. So what does that say when, when things that... He can't do things like that. And I do, I do worry about it immensely. To obviously extremely concerned parents. Mary, Mary Warnock, r just remind us, in summary, what was the original purpose of the statement? What was undertaken once you had a statement? The original purpose, I think, was to um, act as a kind of safeguard for the ch those children who were most severely and most, had the most complicated and multiple handicaps partly so that they could carry their statement with them if their parents moved. The, whatever local authority they were under, that local authority had a statutory duty to supply what was on the statement. That was the idealistic view of the statement. It would have been much better, of course, if the local authority had both provided the statement and um, had to provide the money to supply it. So it was a flawed idea from the beginning, which we were so stupid to think of. That's very um, uh, unequivocally Honest. Neil Clark, you have the predicament which uh, Baroness, Walcott, uh, the Baroness Warnock just identified. You, you've got now, what is it, a quarter of a million children with statements, only 90,000 of them with places, and extremely frustrated and anxious parents as a consequence while the special schools are closing. Well, statementing has become an industry in itself, really. We've got lawyers poring over every word of part two of the statement and examining every clause and <coughs> comma and dot of part three of the statement. And parents have had to cling on to that as a means of getting the services that they're wanting. They have to go to a tribunal to secure the facilities which are named in part three of the, the statement. And I'm still staggered by the number of parents who are willing to spend large amounts of money and huge amounts of time and energy of their own and emotional energy in taking their case to a tribunal. And if they're spending a large amount of money, it, 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 it supposes that those who are better off, better informed, better equipped to do this are going to achieve, yeah. uh, or more likely yeah. to achieve, than those with yeah. fewer LEA, resources and less confidence. LEAs are now em employing officers whose specific task it is to prepare for tribunals, to get the LEA's case for a tribunal ready to go to the hearing. So they will hire a barrister, the parents feel that they have to go to a solicitor and a barrister, and we end up with absurd rituals lasting a day and a half when the tribunal was originally to be an informal exchange of views. Ian Morris, this, this can, whether you think um, there should be special needs schools mm. or whether they should be children included, this, 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 this is an outrage, isn't it? I mean, you're really parents I, are being treated disgracefully. I, I think the, the whole statementing industry is an outrage in, in, in terms of the fact that it sucks so much of, 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 of useful educational resources out of the business of teaching children and meeting their needs into what is essentially a paper chasing exercise uh, and as probably the only person in this room who's actually written statements for a living in a previous job and um, I'm aware of what works of fiction they frequently are. <laughs> um, I, I think just, just works of fiction because 
Um, well, essentially, I think we do have, and this isn't meant to be disrespectful, we do have to go back and say they were essentially a flawed idea, and it's their relationship with resourcing that's interesting. Yes. Because what we've done, as I say, the case two or three years ago was that the demand for statements in most LEAs was growing and growing and growing because it was seen as a way of bringing in additional resources and attaching them to your child. But there was never any clear view of what the school should provide first underneath. So therefore you ended up with people going for the extras because they didn't know what was in the pie. But also there was a desire to get these things because they brought resources. What we've done in Newham to reflect on practice that at least I know well is we've stopped funding statements and the demand for them has fallen away remarkably. We so, used to have about 3.5% of the popula school population in statements, now we've got less than 1% because so what we don't that, give them any money anymore. What, what, what should that tell us, Chris Woodhead, that, that people know they can't afford it and therefore don't go for a statement, or that actually statements um, uh, and special needs, too many people are trying to get extra resources by saying my child should be statemented? Well, they are. I mean, if you live in an authority and you know you're not going to get a statement, whatever you do, presumably the penny's going to drop pretty quickly. They can still have the no statement, point. just not the funding. Um, but I don't think that the original idea was flawed. I mean, it seems to me <coughs> obvious that certain children are going to be more expensive to educate than mm. other children. Oh, the see. problem seems to me the definition of what kinds of educational disabilities ought to attract what sort of resource. And if we had much greater clarity in that, then I think the principle of finding extra money for child, children who've got particular difficulties could be solved within the finite pot. Well, within the finite pot, presumably, Andy Raquel, because you don't, you, you are glad that the number of special schools are reducing. You want to see them, uh, am I right? You actually want to see them phased out altogether. Yes. You must be rather pleased, uh, not necessarily for the individual parents, are rather pleased by the principle that you, 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 you cut, it's very, very difficult to get a statement for a child now. The, the issue is not the statement, the issue is the funding. That's what, that's what parents want. They want the funding, they want the resources for their child. But in the real world, where, where you have a world in which you can go for a, a statement, where if people are not playing fast and loose and just using resources and they're effectively cheating on the children, there are criteria that can be satisfied that say this child should go to a special needs school. You seem to be saying, although you say parents should have choice, what you're actually saying, if I can put it to you like this, is I'm jolly glad that parents don't in reality have choice because we'll get rid of the special schools by default. No, the issue is that those resources should be available in the mainstream. The issue is that in many cases parents know that at this point the only place where they're going to get the relevant resources is in a special school placement and that's why they go for the statement in order to get the resources. It's not the special school placement they want, it's the relevant resources and the proper education for their child. So what would you do now, Baroness Warnock, given, given you say it's a flawed idea and, and, and having heard what you've just heard, what, what do you think should be done now to deal with the problem that should, should be met by statements, allegedly, but clearly isn't? Well, I think that it's going to be very difficult. It would be very difficult altogether to do away with statements because, if only, because government ministers say, no, no, you can't, the statement is a mm. lifeline, a, what we call it, a safety net. Mm. Um, and they think that to do away with statements would say, we're not bothering about children with severe um, difficulties at school at all anymore. So if we keep statements, I would want statements to be, as they are in a way, completely locked in to special schools. I mean, you can't go to a special school without a statement. Darren, Darren Northcott, what's, what, what from your perspective of, and, and your, your members, your teachers, what, what did they, because they obviously come under a lot of pressure uh, in, in this territory, huge mm. pressure. I think one of the things this debate is showing is that, in fact, if statements are distorted in the way in which we've heard, what we're not having is an objective assessment of each individual's child's needs, because what you've got is you've got a whole range of other factors impacting upon the statement. And I think the position that our members often put forward is that you can't educate pupils with special needs appropriately. You can't make effective decisions about where they should be educated and what provision they need if you don't have a system that includes an objective assessment of what this child needs in order to progress and to thrive and where that child should be educated in order to meet those objectives. Minya, you're really at the heart of this because part of your job is to determine whether or not uh, statements are applicable. Because of the resources having to be found by the LEAs and the determination being made locally as well, is there too much power vested? I mean, people are always talking about devolution, but is there too much power vested locally in this particular area? 
Unfortunately, we do rely on statements to bring provision from the authority. And that's how it actually works in the authority I work in. We know there's a tick list in order mm. to get through oh, the panel. That's what I meant. I <laughs> and we can actually work towards that. But I would only do that if I knew that child okay. actually matched the criteria to actually mm. get that statement and that mm. that statement would ensure provision from specialist teachers, especially, to support mainstream staff within a school who haven't got that level of expertise. Because we are totally dependent on either support from special schools or from specialist teachers working in a pupil support service within the authority in order for us to be able to include those children okay. within the school. Let's, let's just pause there, because as we've just been touching on, statements are seen, at least by some parents, as effectively a ticket to a special school, not least because it's become their legally defined function. Yet some people with disabilities are vehemently opposed to special schools, and some are calling for inclusion to be made mandatory. What's important about completely inclusive education is that it is ending hundreds, if not thousands of years of mistreatment and prejudice against people who have needs that are considered different to the majority of people. The wonderful things that are going on in mainstream schools, the efforts teachers have put into it, the benefits to children, both disabled and non-disabled. The difference between Micheline Mason's daughter's educational experiences and her own served to illustrate this progress. I was incredibly isolated at home. Um, I took my 11 plus at home, which happened in those days, past, um, but was then told I shouldn't have been told that I'd got such a good score because there was no school I could go to. I went to mainstream school ever since I went to preschool, nursery school, and I always went to school within my local community, so that meant I really like managed to make good, strong friendships early on with people that lived nearby to me, which have kind of sustain themselves and my life would look completely different if I hadn't been in mainstream education, I don't doubt it. I was one of a very small group of young people at the time that had that opportunity and now I'm part of a very small group of young people that are going into higher education. Mason, mother and daughter and as it were manner for you Andy Raquel because they're making your point that inclusiveness means you don't need these schools. Is it absolutely serious? You would actually see an end to all special schools because one way or another you believe all children can be educated inclusively in mainstream schools? Yes. I think there's a, there's a process to be gone through and as you've indicated there are lots of flaws in the current procedure. In other words, it's not it's something that will happen overnight. But it is something that, that given that child, if, we, if we operate on a child-centred approach to education and deal with that in the, in, in the appropriate place, there's no reason why that can't be uh, in the mainstream and, 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 and therefore that, there is no place for a And that school. isn't, forgive me, just a sort of a big picture ideological drive of the disability lobby. No, I mean, I mean, I think... Are you really thinking education, education, education? Yes, I think I am. And, and, and I, think, I, think there's a, I think there's an issue here about what, is, what sort of society you're trying to create and what sort of society you are creating with the group of children that are going through school. Uh, you've got to get to a situation. All those children are going to become adults. And there's an issue about creating society in which those adults can work together. And it isn't just about looking after the ones that need looking after and, and the others being empathetic towards that. It's recognising the whole diversity of skills in a, in a society which is about a value-added economy. It's about getting the whole diversity of skills that people have to offer. That involves a whole diversity of people being able to be given the best opportunity in education. And Neil Clark, I presume for you, you actually want to see more special places so that, from your perspective, mainstream children don't and their parents aren't constantly... I'm delighted from Miss Mason, but I've got a child with osteogenesis imperfecta in my school and parents had to go to a tribunal to get her in, but she's also flourishing. She's mm. in a small class, she's getting individual attention. Mm. Every child matters. <clears throat> the first two are said, be healthy and be safe. 
she feels very healthy and very safe in the environment that has been chosen by her. And what would happen and if, go back if, to the if that choice is taken away from that family to go for the resident, I'm rather tired of parents being made to feel guilty if they ask for special education for their children, and particularly if they ask for residential special education for their children, because there is such a beast as the extended curriculum, and it can be terri terribly rewarding mm. for children with disabilities and other mm. special needs mm. to have that extended curriculum and have a social life and have leisure facilities which are often not available to them at home. And, and uh, uh, you don't believe, effectively, that you can have, in, with the right resources, inclusion in mainstream schools in order to deliver what we just heard very passionately, uh, a society which uh, is genuinely socially integrated and de uh, delivering the best from all its contributing citizens. I still think we can have both if we come down to parental choice and student choice. Mm. No children in my school are there against their will. They've made a positive choice that they prefer the idea of a special school. Their parents have sought it from the LEA, often had to fight for it, but it's been a very positive choice. And I don't feel that our children are segregated or not included. Mm. What I would like to come back to is why can't we have both? Why can't mm. we have inclusion in our mainstream schools? for those for whom it's appropriate mm. and why can't we have if we just add the word the letters IST to special you can almost transform the debate let's have specialist mm. schools mm. Mm. Yeah. where there's a reservoir of expertise and experience which can be tapped into on behalf of those children mm. for whom the mainstream experience is a damaging or a disastrous one in Morris well I, I I, I do feel, I mean, one of the things we were trailed before, I was trailed before we, I came here, was that it was, it was a discussion that was about light rather than heat. And it isn't always an oppositional agenda, that's the point. I come from the most inclusive education authority, etc. But I know there are perfectly good special I schools hope you didn't in this think country. This was heat. You should see heat. In <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You should, go to a, you should go to a teacher's conference. I appreciate that. Now, what I'm trying to say is that I don't expect that there will actually be a difference between the two gentlemen sitting opposite me. They both want the best outcomes. Yeah for the young people who they deal with, yeah. but they take slightly different routes to get yeah. there. I think that where we are on the ground in Newham is we still have some residual special provision, and it's parents who want their children to go there. Our job as inclusionists, if we wish to be called such, is simply to demonstrate over time that the outcome for children in mainstream settings is preferable and to encourage more parents to make that choice. Aren't you forgive me, aren't you? that every school in Newham can be inclusive no. of every sort of special I was just about. Need. I was just about to say that we, we have our history and our geography to take into account and the geography means that many of our schools are closely grouped mm. and therefore mm. can work together and can offer different specialisms and we resource some more strongly for certain needs. But also the history, and that's the big issue about the duopoly that doesn't work, is, I mean, Chris was very right about saying there has to be a boundary around utopian funding, and I, I, I would agree with him completely. Um, and the issues there are the fact you can't afford to run both systems effectively. And that's where this really starts to become more adversarial. Yeah. You cannot have well-equipped, well-resourced special schools and well-equipped, well-resourced mainstream schools that can deliver to every child. Mm. At some point, because of the finite nature of the budget, when we did what we did in Newham, we did it at a time when local authorities could retain a heck of a lot more strategic funding than they can now, employ centralised teachers, bribe, I've heard it described, schools to take these kids by throwing in TAs and staff. But we created a culture over the past 25 years in which now their rights to be there is not largely disputed. But we couldn't do it now. Mm. Yeah. Chris Woodhead. Yeah. Ultimately, it's not a matter of funding, in my view. Uh, it is a matter of fact, in my view, that there are some children who cannot be educated in mainstream schools. Mm -hmm. Children who lie and cannot move, children who are effectively brain dead. To suggest that such children can be taught in mainstream schools seems to be nonsensical. Well, can, can you come across we, the spectrum <coughs> a bit from that very, no, if you like, extreme example? No, no, just out of curiosity. Children can be educated in mainstream schools. Mm. They can't. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, answer, if, you, if you then come mm -hmm. further, up the capacity spectrum, if you like. Some, some can and some can't, and it is a matter then in determining where those children are educated of one, right. where their parents want them to be educated, and two, whether or not the mainstream school thinks that it can educate them without sacrificing the mainstream children. Mm. But, but it, I think um, Chris mentioned the most severely disabled children who can't sit up or feed themselves or anything, and they, those children can still be educated, and this is one of the things mm. that I think our report so did and that yeah. I claim mm. credit for, yeah. to expand yes. the concept of education mm. so that it includes those children. And I agree with him, that if you put them in a mainstream school, you're going to put them in a 
unit or something. It's not inclusion, but it may be education. But I think one oughtn't to think that there's a steady kind of rise in ability that means that the children at the top are easy to integrate and the children at the bottom right. are not, because there are children whose behaviour right. is so yeah. difficult to manage, um, and they are so difficult to manage themselves, they may be very intelligent. Mm. So it's not a matter of intelligence, but it's those children who are the most difficult to accommodate, I think. OK, I'm just going to, to, to take us uh, forward into our sort of last stride, as it were. If, if there's a, a range of special educational needs, as we've just been discussing, why not a range of provision? Touched on that as well. It seems a pretty naive question, but why can't mainstream and special schools perhaps simply work together? Partnerships between the two sectors are, in fact, already developing. We went to look at one such collaboration in North London. Eight-year-old Gabriel gets ready to go to school with his six-year-old sister Sarah and dad Jonathan. Okay, bye, mummy. Gabriel has autistic spectrum disorder. Right. For him, even the most rudimentary forms of social interaction are difficult. Outward signs of communication are sporadic. But Gabriel is not a victim, he's a pioneer, and his experience of schooling could offer a way forward for children with special needs across the country. To help meet his learning needs, Gabriel attends not one school, but two. For a day and a half a week, he goes with his sister to a local mainstream primary the Martin Infant School. Here, with the help of his full-time learning assistant, Gabriel joins in the full range of mainstream school activities. Okay, have fun. Bye. All the children initiate um, conversations or games or play alongside him. They show him around to the toilets and, and support him. And indeed, in the assembly this morning, they were they were helping and guiding him. But for the rest of the week, Gabriel attends a special school with other ASD children. It's called the Tree House. Gabriel is on our role full time. So this uh, link we've made with Martins is above Martins uh, class numbers. But we, we go with the staff with the expertise here that Gabriel is familiar with. The idea of forging a partnership between a mainstream and a special school was brokered by Gabriel's parents, who had concerns about placing him full-time in either setting. A one-size-fits-all approach doesn't necessarily work. Surely we can see that there is a spectrum of need. If there's a spectrum of need, then why can there not be a spectrum of delivery? Both schools took to the idea readily, but making it work has taken a good deal of organisation and commitment on both sides. Partnership does work, um, and I would recommend it. Um, I, I would say, but, but, but tread cautiously and look at the implications. Have a proper dialogue with all the parties. Four! How many? At the Treehouse, staff deploy an extensive range of techniques designed to connect with the private worlds of the children they teach. Classes are small. Group work is broken up by one-to-one -one sessions and progress is constantly rewarded with stints in the well-equipped playground. Whee! It's a far cry from the kind of teaching Gabriel gets at his mainstream school, but in combination the two experiences seem to be adding up to success. For me the bottom line has been, is he happy? Is he a happy little boy? Although it may seem very small, I know that that little smile when he gets out the car tells me that he's happy, he wants to be here. He's learning. Whatever the implications may be of the partnership initiative, it has at least allowed one little boy with severe learning difficulties to do something many children take for granted, walk to school with his sister. And for that alone, the effort seems worth it. Yeah, he's lucky because most um, autistic children like him can't really understand, but he's lucky. wonderful touching moment. A big sort of final question if you like, can you afford both in educational, human, social terms not to have partnerships of that kind develop? Can you afford in similar terms, can you afford to have them develop? Menia. We've had a success story trying to do the same thing this year with a child with Down syndrome, quite complex needs and we didn't feel we could meet 
his needs academically within our school where we had uh, mainstream classes in year seven and he, he was coming to year seven. So he's gone to another Welsh medium school in Cardiff who have unit provision for four days a week. He joins us on a Wednesday, so he's with his sister in school. His younger brother will be joining us next year. He's with his friends from the village he lives in, and we are, are concentrating on the social inclusion. And at our last annual review, parents and everyone around the table, especially his teachers, everyone thought, yes, this is working for this particular young boy. Sort of the way ahead, perhaps, Neil Clark? I mean, I'm thrilled for Gabriel and his family, and that's, that's, that's a wonderful mm. story. But mm. perhaps when Gabriel's 11, those same parents make may make some different choices in the light of the transfer mm, yeah, from absolutely. primary to secondary, which we yeah, all know is yeah. huge. It's huge for every 11-year-old, yeah. much more so yeah. for a child with autistic spectrum disorder. Philippa, they need to be listened to when he's 11 as well. Mm. I think there's a range of ways in which special schools and mainstream schools can come mm. together. Mm. So a range of schools are now co-located um, mm. in a number of authorities uh, where they're building new schools, they're trying to locate special schools mm. on the same mm. site mm. as mainstream mm. schools, and who knows where those links will develop mm. to. Um, but I think the, the key thing for me there is Gabriel's dad said uh, he's happy, happy. Mm. and he's learning. Now, yes. by mm. and large, children are not happy when they're not learning. Mm -hmm. And I think the key thing for me is that we are wasting a huge resource if we are not ensuring that all our children are learning in our schools. Mm. All the, all the outcomes nationally say that, uh, that you know, international comparisons say that we're doing reasonably well, but we're doing disastrously badly in terms of equalities. And the children who start out in the system with, with slightly greater difficulties than others are not thriving in our system. And I think that's the bit for me. If we can ensure that children are learning and happy, uh, and they will be happy if they are learning, uh, then we're going to get better outcomes for them. And we can't afford to waste that potential. Chris Woodhead, you, you keep anchoring our feet in financial <laughs> and resource reality. Is there something in there that makes sense that is also achievable in financial and resource terms? Yeah, but also I'm interested in principles and, and logic. It isn't just a matter of money. I mean, Gabriel's dad got it right. Um, a spectrum of need, a spectrum of provision. And I'm all for partnerships if the partnerships can be made mm. to work yeah. and if the mainstream head teacher thinks that he can accommodate the child without sacrificing the interests of other children. But if we're going to have partnerships, we've got to have special schools to mm. form the partnerships. Mm. Mm. And the way we're going, we ain't going to have no special well, schools. <laughs> I, I'm going to come back to where we started with Baroness Warnock and the encroaching disaster. You started all of this, as it were, 30 years ago. You instigated this debate, in effect, by your, your report and your, your anxieties about the future. What do you think is actually likely to happen? What is going to happen? I think one curious thing that's going to happen, and is already happening, is that the government is quietly, surreptitiously almost, encouraging schools, special schools, to become specialist schools and they can be for children, let us say, uh, for, for uh, pupils with moderate learning difficulties which specialise in, let us say, IT or sport. There are already 30 schools like this in existence and the Prime Minister let it be known that he wanted this number to expand and he wanted um, schools special schools to put in for specialist status um, if they felt they could raise the money, the money they need to do that locally. And they are raising that money. And I've been to one of these schools only, but I know that there are lots of others. And it is a curious thing that's going on at the same time, that special schools are, they are called special, specialist non-maintained schools. And they are increasing in number and they can be very good. I, are you, is it your view? Baroness Warnock, that though you fear um, a disastrous legacy, you have a small glimmer of hope that it's going to be got right. I do, but I still think that the legacy is disastrous for a particular kind of child who is the most difficult to accommodate in the mainstream, which is a child with behavioural difficulties. There we uh, have to pause. Baroness Warnock. Other distinguished guests here, my thanks to you all. However much the panel, and indeed the education profession as a whole, may dispute the best way forward for special needs education, we can, I guess, agree, all of us, on one thing, that the 
issue of inclusion goes to the very heart of the kind of education that we want for our children. Incidentally, the Parliamentary Education Select Committee inquiry into SCN provision is due to report its findings in the spring. Let's hope it casts as much light, indeed, even more on this crucial topic as our panel has managed today. For now, goodbye. Thank you.